Labor is life, said Carlyle over 100 years ago. Of course, what he meant is that the most satisfying part of our lives is labor, the work that we do. That's still true today, but 100 years ago when he wrote that, it could have been reversed easily and still been true. Life then was labor, in the sense of life was hard work. In fact, until not so very many years ago, there was little time for anything else. Little time for family, for leisure, for community affairs. Just time enough to work and eat and sleep and work again. The many geniuses of man, however, changed all that. His inventive genius devised machines to do much of his heavy labor. His economic and political genius built a free enterprise system and a democratic government. His social genius brought democracy to the marketplace in the form of trade unions that meant higher wages, better working conditions, and shorter hours. Shorter hours and a chance for all of us to do something about the place where we live, as well as the place where we work. A chance to think of family and of the simple pleasures of living and of the community in which we live. Now, what are we doing with this leisure time? Or more precisely, what are the workers and their unions doing with it? How are they meeting the responsibilities of being citizens and neighbors? Exactly what does happen when the day's work is done? These are some of the things we'll be examining in this special report. They say voluntary social welfare agencies are a uniquely American institution. And certainly there are enough of them. United Funds, uh, Community Chests, Boy Scouts. Red Cross. The list sometimes seems endless, but so is the work that the men and women of organized labor do for these agencies. Look around and you'll see them, the long line of volunteers, thousands and thousands of them, giving that precious commodity that we call time. They're the planners, the doorbell ringers, the telephone callers, and whatever has to be done, count on them. And they're the givers, too. The amounts are often small, but they add up. The social agencies say that union men and women, numbering not even 10% of the population, comprise America's biggest philanthropists. Last year, United Funds and Community Chests alone got more than one-third of their money, $175 million, from labor alone. Everybody does this, you say? Well, we'll try this then next time. Next time you see a Red Cross mobile disaster unit in action, check and see where it came from. Next time you see a bus transporting the physically handicapped, look to see who gave that bus. Take Traveler's Aid, an old standby in railroad, bus, and airline terminals. Now it has an additional role and a brand new one. And who gave Traveler's Aid this new look, this added mobility to go out on the highway where today's problems are? with migrant workers, for example. Why not ask? In her lifetime, when she gave her name and her energies to the fight on cancer, Eleanor Roosevelt knew, and today, in her memory, that work goes on to fight all of the battles that she fought from the struggle for human rights at home to the struggle for life itself abroad. And it's broader even than that. The cultural center drive which President Kennedy began and the memorial library being erected in his memory are testimony to that. So are the college students who each year receive more than a million dollars in labor scholarships. What kind of students? Young people like Larry Clyde Headley of Hearts, West Virginia, for one. 
With my economic background, I don't think it would have been possible for me to attend college without financial assistance of some sort. I was about a year old when my father died. He had a small farm in one of the hollows near Hearts, which we lived on. We grew corn and vegetables for the house. My mother taught at two one-room schools near Hearts. I worked about five years as a janitor at the Workman Elementary School. High school I attended was at Chapmanville, West Virginia. It was about 10 miles in all from my home. I walked about a little over a mile to catch the school bus and then in the afternoons from the school bus back to my home. About 2,000 miles in all in the total of four years. In the spring of 1959, I heard about my receipt of a National Merit Scholarship, which would pay my expenses and tuition for four years at West Virginia University. The scholarship I received made it possible in this way for me to attend college, and I am very grateful to the people who sponsored the scholarship which I received. Money for education is an investment in the future. So are cooperative housing projects. Lots of them are going up these days on what used to be slums. But we've been talking about dollars, as though you really measured citizenship in dollars. Actually, community service takes many different and more important forms. Remember when the Red Army crushed the Hungarian freedom fighters? At the Camp Kilmer Refugee Center, Labor mobilized its resources to find jobs and homes for those who asked asylum. And when that job was done, when 30,000 Hungarian refugees had been admitted to our country, the unions had helped more than two-thirds of them to start new lives in America. Remember the Cubans who wanted to get away from Castro's communism? Well, labor helped again there cooperating with the agencies that were helping the Cubans join the American community life. And later, when the anti-communist forces captured at the Bay of Pigs were finally liberated, it took still more cooperation to finance and ship the medical supplies that Castro demanded as ransom. More than in merely dollars are clearly involved in what labor does, both on the job and when the day's work is done. In fact, the giving of money is probably the easiest thing that you can do. It's the giving of yourself that is difficult, because that means your time and your thought and your effort. It means your personal commitment. There is something of yourself in every drop of blood that goes to the local blood bank. It's only a pint of blood, some people might say, but it's far more than just that because it is the gift of life itself. And those pints mount up, mount up to hundreds of thousands of gallons a year. Out of every three pints of blood given in this country, one of them comes from an AFL-CIO member. Sometimes you give of yourself on a massive scale, fighting disaster the way a country fights a war. 
And like battles, disasters have names we remember. Names like Alaska, 1964, after the earthquake there. Names like Hurricane Audrey, that's one to remember. Hundreds dead, thousands and thousands homeless. Whole communities leveled by wind and tidal wave. And what came afterward is worth remembering, too, the hundreds of building tradesmen who voluntarily worked weekends and holidays under the broiling sun of Louisiana to build new homes and new communities, and giving thereby the greatest gift they had, their skills. But you don't have to wait for disaster. There are always needs to be met. It may be a one-time project, like this camp for underprivileged children, which took four and a half years worth of weekends of what otherwise would have been leisure time. Art can be a continuing program. For 17 years, unionists on Long Island have been working on community projects. Ask Buddy Long, president of the Long Island Building Trades Council. It all started down in Nassau County, where 26 children were being treated for cerebral palsy in the basement of the American Legion building. I brought 43 delegates down from the Building Trades Council to look these children over. They were all choked up. We went back to the Building Trades Council and voted unanimous to give them a building, build them a building with free labor, no cost whatsoever. And we've been doing this for the last 17 years. Yes, 17 years. And 17 years have included not only a cancer research center, Rehabilitation Center for the Physically Handicapped, but many other things. Measured in dollars and cents, it's been millions of dollars worth of free labor. Measured in time, it's been nearly a half million man hours. The amount of leisure time spent by any medium-sized community on golf, fishing, and tennis during an entire summer. And in terms of social good, well, how do you measure that? They say you can measure public service by what's done for the very young or the very old. So put your yardstick on things such as the mass vaccinations against polio. Add in those warm touches such as special recreation for handicapped children. Be sure you include the hundreds of parties for thousands of children, especially at Christmas time. And don't forget all those summer camps, the ones that get the underprivileged kids out of the city and into the country for at least a little time each summer. Then try to imagine the time that must go into coaching Little League baseball teams. On, 
and in the scouting movement. Some 450 Boy Scout troops sponsored by AFL-CIO unions. Some 20% of all scout leaders are union members. But maybe you prefer something special, in which case, look in on one of the programs set up for high school students. Citizen apprenticeship, as unions call it. Carol West of Woodrow Wilson High School, Camden, New Jersey, can tell you something about that. They started this program in our town a few years ago. On weekends, the union people and the agency people teach us about social services. You know, the welfare agency, the old people's home, programs to help kids in trouble. And it's not just looking and listening either. We get a chance to do something too. We do volunteer work with the agencies, just like the grown-ups do. Citizen apprenticeship. You could call it a bridge, if you like. A bridge between the world of the adolescent and the world of the adult. And at the other end of the spectrum, you'll find a warm kind of service at the retirement centers. Places where oldsters find the pleasures of companionship and the opportunities for work and play. And it doesn't really much matter whether it's the friendly competition of games or productive hobbies for fingers that aren't too stiff or an occasional dance to prove that they haven't lost their zest for life. What counts is that senior citizens know they haven't been forgotten. The very young and the very old. And the rest of us, well, for some, it's a mobile health clinic. This one in Shimokin, Pennsylvania, is a joint labor management project. Some of Pennsylvania's garment plants are far removed from regular health centers, so the clinic comes to them with free medical checkups twice a year. Others of us, it may be some of the free concerts that members of the Musicians' Union give each year. Service can mean that extra effort for our men and women in uniform through volunteer work at a USO center here at home. Or it can be members of entertainment unions traveling half a world away to provide special shows for lonely GIs at bases all over the world. No question about it, Serving the community can mean many things. It can be the trade unionist heading up a community group to bring new industry to an area which needs more jobs for its people.
It can mean giving your free time to work with other civic leaders on a slum clearance program. Union members serve as mayors or members of city councils and county commissions, in state legislatures and in Congress. How many do? No one, it seems, has ever counted them up, but there are many. You'll find them on welfare commissions, police commissions, park commissions, uh, boards of education, in big cities and in small towns. Again, nobody knows how many, but scratch any effective program for community action, public health, welfare, education, recreation, you name it. Scratch any one of these, and chances are you'll find an AFL-CIO member. We discussed all this with George Meany, the president of the AFL-CIO, and with Joseph Byrne, president of the communications workers and chairman of the AFL-CIO community services program. Mr. Meany, how long has the trade union movement been in this social welfare field? As a practical matter, I suppose you could say since the very beginning of the movement. One of the first campaigns organized labor undertook was for free public schools in the United States. And that's a cause we continue to support vigorously. Over the years, we've helped win workmen's compensation for people injured on the job and factory inspection laws to make sure workshops are safe. We fought against child labor and for insurance for workers who are unemployed through no fault of their own. I suppose you could say all this was social welfare. You surely could, and for over 100 years now. For the American people, of course. And then, of course, we've been active in the international field, in international labor relations from our inception, through fraternal ties with the trade unions overseas. Uh, Samuel Gompers, for instance, was largely responsible for the existence of the International Labor Organization, the only continuing specialized organization of the United Nations. Through our international ties, we became aware uh, back in the 30s that free trade unions in Germany were in for a bad time once Hitler came to power. That's because dictatorships, uh, whether of the left or right, just don't allow trade unions to remain free. So within 60 days after Hitler took over in Germany, we had a labor organization in the United States that was raising funds for the Union people who were the first victims of the Nazis. I remember. Then after Pearl Harbor, you probably rem remember the National War Fund. Mm -hmm. It was set up to finance the USO, foreign relief agencies, organizations like that. So we got involved in that too. Then we expanded in this field after the war. We knew people at home had problems, too, and we felt we had something to contribute. So we've been in this business of helping people for a long time. Well, now, labor's efforts in social welfare are the responsibility of your committee, Mr. Byrne, I believe. Well, we have a full-time department for this. You see, there's a lot involved because we work with what I like to call uh, a network of agencies. Not only the voluntary ones, but the government agencies, too. The labor movement is interested in a broad range of programs. Mental health, family services, youth programs, fluoridation, rehabilitation. All of the areas you'd expect to concern us. Not just as union members, but as citizens. Yet you've told me, Mr. Byrne, that it's a pretty modest operation as far as staff goes, I mean. That's right. Just a handful of people. But backing them up are 150 specially trained labor people with the United uh, Funds and Community Chests in about 65 cities. These people who come from the labor movement carry a big load. They are referral agents who help union members find the right agency when they have problems. They're educators who help develop broad labor interests in welfare issues and needs. They're fundraisers and they're community organizers who recruit and train other unionists. And that's still not the whole story. We have 75,000 union members who help plan the programs of their health and welfare agencies. And another 60,000 unionists are trained to counsel people who are in trouble. And remember, these counselors are all volunteers. So while our operation is modest in terms of full-time staff, it's anything but modest in terms of services. Well, much of what we've seen, of course, is done directly through union channels, but isn't a lot more of it uh, just good old-fashioned citizenship on an individual basis? Of course, and as you're suggesting, it 
probably would be done whether we had a community services program or not. After all, plenty of union people were active in community affairs on an individual basis long before our program started. Well, let, let me tell you what's even more to the point, Dave. This adds up to making union members more aware of their responsibility as citizens. We're encouraging them to use a part of their leisure time for things that benefit the whole community. Mr. Meany, why does organized labor support so many of these programs? Uh, first with its manpower, and then with its dollars, too. Uh, what does the AFL-CIO really hope to get out of all this? Uh, why are we in this field? Well, social work tries to solve problems. And we in the labor movement have always been concerned with helping people in trouble. This is a natural extension of the work we do every day. You ask what we hope to get out of it? Well, in the narrow sense of any direct returns to the labor movement as such, the answer is nothing. But one thing we do get the satisfaction of knowing we're using our resources for the public good. And of course, our members get out of it just what every other citizen gets, a better community and a better life. It's all in keeping with the symbol of the AFL-CIO. You know, the clasped hands of brotherhood. Yes, I think that's the heart of the matter. Our community services program is just another way of showing people that, as we put it, labor is your neighbor. Labor is your neighbor and the clasped hands of brotherhood. Two pretty good ways of defining labor citizenship. All citizenship seems to us uh, primarily as a struggling for a better way of life. A striving which, as a part of itself, engenders an act of faith. Faith in our fellow human beings, faith in our American institutions, and faith in the future of this young and vigorous country of ours. And labor citizenship we find in the volunteer hours and the volunteer dollars that support the social and cultural and public service assets of the community and the state and the nation. This is labor citizenship on the job and when the day's work is done. Courage.